Welcome to our Constitution Day event. Happy to have you with us uh, to hear from two esteemed guests uh, who are going to help us through one of the big questions of our time, which is uh, uh, the recent development that now that there is no more federal constitutional right uh, for a woman to terminate a pregnancy at certain points uh, of the pregnancy, uh, many, many questions being asked about what state law or state constitutions uh, might do, or state courts, of course, uh, to fill that gap. Uh, so we have uh, two guests here to really help us through that, especially with regard to our locations in Michigan and Florida. Uh, before we begin, uh, just a few notes about how we will proceed today. Uh, guests will be muted to avoid background noise and, and feedback during the event. Uh, we do encourage you, please, to leave your cameras on uh, to the extent possible so speakers can engage uh, with the audience. Uh, we'll begin with uh, speaker uh, introductions, uh, and the speakers then, of course, will briefly introduce uh, the topics that they will discuss. Once our speakers have, have uh, given us some background about uh, uh, what's going on in, in those respective states, we'll have a moderated uh, Q&A session. We ask guests, uh, please participate by raising your hand uh, or adding uh, questions to the chat. We'll do our best to keep track of raised hands and chat questions. Please, uh, please uh, know that closed captioning is available. Uh, if you'd like to use that, please select the CC box in the lower left-hand corner of the page. I will now uh, introduce our speakers. Uh, first, joining us is uh, Judge Elizabeth uh, Gleischer. Uh, Judge Gleischer was appointed to the Michigan Court of Appeals in 2007. Previously, she was an attorney in private practice for 27 years. She be uh, began her career at Goodman, Eden, Millinder, and Brodasian in Detroit and opened her own litigation practice in 1994. She's an elected fellow of the International Society of Barristers and the American College of Trial Lawyers. She received the Respected Advocate Award from the Michigan Defense Trial Council in 2005 and the State Bar of Michigan Champion of Justice Award in 2001. Judge Gleischer has served on the faculty of the Institute of Continuing Legal Education and as an adjunct professor at Wayne Law. She holds her bachelor's degree from Carleton College in Minnesota and her law degree from Wayne Law. And a warm welcome to Judge Gleischer. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, our second guest is Dr. William Myers. Uh, Dr. Myers is an associate professor of political science and international studies at the University of Tampa. He holds a PhD uh, in political science from Michigan State University and a, a BA in history from the University of Michigan. Dr. Myers' research focuses on judicial politics, intergovernmental relations, and political behavior in the United States. Boy, there's an interesting topic, political behavior in the United States, but also Australia, Canada, Ghana and the European Union. His teaching is centered on American comparative politics with emphasis on uh, judicial politics, constitutional law, as well as law and policy. Dr. Myers also directs the, uh, uh, the Courts Law Analytics and Policy Lab at the University of Tampa. So I would like to welcome, of course, uh, Dr. Myers as well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. And my understanding is that Dr. Myers, you're gonna lead us off um, and um, and introduce the judge. Uh, sure, if I can figure out how to uh, share my screen here, I guess. There we go. So uh, the, the title of our uh, discussion today, Post Dobbs, the, the State of the State. You can move on to the next slide. Just briefly uh, make sure that we're all on the same page. So this is referring to Dobbs versus Jackson's Women Health Organization. Uh, this case um, at the Supreme Court dealt with a Mississippi law that prohibited abortions, um, with some exceptions, uh, up to 15 weeks. And in uh, June of this year, the Supreme Court handed down a 6-3 decision um, on that case. You can move to the next slide. And the, the big kind of takeaways um, from, from the case, um, from Justice Alito's majority opinion, was that Abortion is uh, not part of the liberty protected uh, through the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, and that additionally, abortion rights are not considered um, an essential part of the ordered liberty. It's uh, deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition, 
as uh, originalism would uh, tell us uh, needs to be true. Of course, the big kind of takeaway is that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey are overruled, and the authority to regulate abortion is returned to the people and their elected representatives. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll see what our elected representatives have been up to. And so across the states, we are seeing quite a bit of activity. Um, Indiana, uh, their uh, ban went into effect yesterday, so we can add them to the uh, group of uh, states where, uh, I guess now 16, that uh, abortion is banned or mostly banned. Uh, five states currently, the courts are blocking those bans. 20 states now have uh, abortion rights that are legal and likely to be protected. In nine states, uh, like Michigan and Florida, uh, it's essentially legal for now. If we can move on to the next slide. We can at least see what the public is thinking about um, the Supreme Court's decision. And so this was some polling that came out really the week after um, the Dobbs decision from Pew. And we can at least see that a majority of the country is not in agreement with the Supreme Court's decision to not recognize uh, a right to abortion as protected by the Constitution. And what's also at least helpful for us is that Pew breaks this down by states grouping in terms of what types of prohibitions, what types of restrictions, and what types of future availability of abortion um, how those, how the people in those states view this decision, and every every state, no matter what, um, where we've got a majority supporting the right to an abortion protected by the Constitution. So there is at least a strong sense amongst the country that abortion should be protected, despite what our elected representatives are are up to and what they've been doing. If we can move on to the next slide, please. And so, since Michigan and Florida are part of that legal for now state, it's at least important for us to understand the populations that are involved and especially the number of women who, uh, whose rights are directly implicated through these decisions, especially what our state governments are going to be doing. There's been a lot of activity in both states, in Michigan in particular. Uh, We've had some litigation involving Act 328 from 1931, and there's an ongoing, um, uh, well, there was some ongoing litigation uh, involving the ballot uh, initiative, the Right to Reproductive Freedom Initiative, which the Michigan Supreme Court has now brought onto the ballot. So voters in Michigan will be deciding this question in November. In Florida, um, our big activity has revolved around HB5, House Bill 5, which was passed in April of this year, that put forward a 15 week ban, um, but notably did not include any exceptions for rape or incest. That bill is currently in litigation and is sitting at the Florida Supreme Court. So this is where we're at right now. And so if we can move on to the next slide, we can uh, turn things over to uh, Judge Gleischer. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, 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 a great overview. And actually, I want to start with, I think, the second slide, um, but you don't have to put it back on. I'll, I'll recap it. Um, I'm delighted to talk about state constitutions today. On Constitution Day, uh, my focus is going to be on the power and the need for state constitutions, particularly in the legal age in which we find ourselves. Um, I'm probably the oldest person in, the, in this uh, Zoom room, and I've seen a lot of change in our country and in the Supreme Court, and I've never seen the United States Supreme Court in a retrenchment mood or mode uh, similar to the one in which we now live. And by that, I mean a mode in which uh, every civil right and civil liberty that those of us who grew up in the 1960s and the 1970s took for granted seems to be on the table. Um, my takeaway from that political moment or our political moment is that it is a time 
for state courts and state constitutions to come to the fore in terms of protections of civil rights and civil liberties. Um, as Professor Meyer pointed out, Justice Alito made an important point relevant to that in Dobbs. And I'm going to repeat by reading aloud the last lines of his opinion in Dobbs, which Professor Meyer showed on the slide. Uh, Justice Alito ended the opinion with this pronouncement. Abortion presents a profound moral question. The Constitution does not prohibit the citizens of each state from regulating or prohibiting abortion. Roe and Casey arrogated that authority. We now overrule those decisions and return that authority to the people and their elected representatives. I'm not sure that Justice Alito fully anticipated uh, what that meant, returning the authority to the people and their elected representatives. The people here in the state of Michigan will vote on an amendment to our Constitution. Uh, it will likely pass, given the polling uh, that's out there now, and that will uh, legalize abortion and enshrine the right to abortion in our Constitution. I am an elected representative of the people. I'm an elected judge. Um, as many of you know, I recently wrote an opinion uh, holding that our 1931 law is unconstitutional. Um, returning the authority to regulate or prohibit abortion to the people also means, obviously, returning to the people the ability to legalize abortion, uh, an act that the people really didn't think was necessary, I think, while Roe was uh, in force. Um, so, Let's talk, I want to talk about what state constitutions are all about and why state constitutions provide a framework and provide a pathway for the, the expansion of civil rights, including the right to abortion. Um, obviously, as a fundamental premise of federalism, we know that states Ha, uh, have the ability to ratify, to draft and ratify their own constitutions, and that state constitutions are supposed to play an important role in state governance. governance. Um, we know also, uh, as a matter of uh, absolute certainty, that states are permitted under our federal system to interpret their state constitutions in a manner that is more protective of civil liberties, more expansive than the Bill of Rights. Um, we have a great example here in Michigan, and it happens to be a, a case called Sitz versus Michigan State Police. And I had the honor and the privilege of actually being in the United States Supreme Court the day that case was argued. Uh, Sitz involved the constitutionality of sobriety check lanes. So check lanes that that were by the Michigan State Police randomly around the state to stop drivers to see if anyone uh, had been drinking alcohol. And our state courts had ruled that those check lanes were unconstitutional under the Fourth Amendment. The Michigan State Police brought the case to the United States Supreme Court, which uh, overruled all of the state decisions, the Court of Appeals and the Michigan Supreme Court, and held that in fact, sobriety check lanes were uh, permissible under the Fourth Amendment. Well, the next chapter was also very interesting because the case came back to the Michigan Supreme Court under the Michigan Constitution's uh, Fourth Amendment analog, and the Michigan Supreme Court very firmly held that sobriety check lanes are illegal under the Michigan Constitution, uh, and I'll say politely thumbed its nose uh, at the United States Supreme Court and the United States Supreme Court's uh, Fourth Amendment determination. The court, the Michigan Supreme Court basically said, we have an independent provision that protects the right of people and drivers to have privacy, and that that is what we are going to uh, honor in this case. We also know that there's another great example of state courts around the country rejecting the U.S. Supreme Court's decision uh, in the Fourth Amendment context again, and that is the constitutionality 
of what I call the garbage search um, cases in which people put out their garbage. And you may, I don't know how many of you students have gotten to this yet, but you may expect that you may have expected wrongly that it, when you put your garbage out, you have some privacy interest in your garbage. But the uh, US Supreme Court says, no, you don't. Once you put your garbage out on the driveway or in the, on the street, uh, anybody can search uh, your garbage. Well, that's been rejected by at least five Supreme state Supreme Courts and and vigorously uh, and resoundingly, I might add so. Um, so there's no doubt, I think, at this moment in time about the ability of state courts to chart their own constitutional pathways using their own state constitutions to do that. State judges are fully empowered under our federal system uh, to declare that state constitutions contain uh, and afford more rights than the federal constitution. The federal constitution will always be the floor, but it will never be the ceiling for uh, personal, for civil, for civil rights and civil liberties. So what role should the opinions of state courts play in that process? Uh, and what role should the, let me back up, what role should the United States Supreme Court play in the process of state courts deciding and determining what do our state constitutions say and mean? Well, a as a matter of, of, of practical reality, all of us as judges know that most of our constitutional bill of rights in the Michigan, we have a 1963 constitution, we have a what we call a declaration of rights, and we have rights enumerated that pretty much echo in terms of the language, the language of the United States Supreme Court. So one pathway that obviously state judges can take is just to say, well, we uh, interpret our uh, constitutional bills of rights, our declarations of rights to mimic in, in the same way we're in lockstep with the Supreme Court. But luckily that that is is not the case for the reasons I said I gave you a minute ago. But I do think um, that the United States Supreme Court opinions on the same uh, constitutional provisions are entitled to respectful consideration. I would I would be a, a, a proponent of that. But I also uh, believe that one of the things we have to keep in mind when we think about interpreting independently a state constitution is that state constitutions were in fact drafted and ratified often in entirely different eras. Um, our constitution in Michigan was drafted and ratified in 1961 to 1963. That's a long time after the US Constitution and even the 14th Amendment. Your constitution in Florida or the constitution in Florida has a specific right to privacy provision uh, that does not appear in the US Constitution. Our, our constitution in Michigan has a specific provision protecting uh, public health and putting health at the forefront of uh, the legislative agenda for our state. Um, so while our constitution may share many of the same words as the federal constitution, I think that if we look at an originalist perspective, uh, what was intended it's a whole different, uh, we come at, we have to come at it in a whole different way because history has changed uh, so profoundly between uh, 1792 uh, or whatever the year was, I can't remember at the moment, 1789, 92, when the US Constitution was ratified and 1963 when our Constitution took effect. Um, I think that uh, state courts have an obligation to interpret their constitutions independently, uh, particularly now in an era where civil rights and civil liberties are being challenged. Um, I think that a, a, a key question that all of us, and especially you young lawyers in the audience are gonna have to confront is um, essentially who is going to decide the question of civil rights and civil liberties going forward. Um, I, I have to flash back, and this is where I'm gonna close, because everything I've said, I 
I think is meaningful to me and something I believe in, but I do take pause in history. Um, I take pause in history because when I was uh, uh, growing up, I certainly watched a uh, the unfolding of the civil rights movement in the United States. I watched states, I listened to and, and observed uh, the phenomenon of states' rights and the idea that states could deny uh, people of color the right to attend integrated schools, deny the right to sit down at uh, a lunch counter. So when I here, am here before you applauding federalism and applauding in a sense, in a sense, rights, I take my words with a grain of salt. Um, despite my criticisms of the United States Supreme Court's opinion in Dobbs and my feeling that it wasn't well reasoned on a number of levels, um, I am grateful that we have a United States Supreme Court that has thus far uh, a, stood for the protection of civil rights and civil liberties. And part of me is very concerned about the idea of throwing that back to the state. And I'll just say that the map uh, that Professor Myers threw up there with the patchwork of protection for a woman's right to control her own body is disheartening um, and worrisome. And I'm very interested in hearing what the other people on this panel have to say about whether we should be concerned that in this country, we may wind up with states that are protective of personal rights and liberties and states that aren't. Is that a good thing for the country? I'm not sure. Um, so. Very, very interested in the dialogue to follow. Okay, so there's a real need to start shifting our thinking at the state level towards what can actually protect um, women's rights uh, to, again, not only control their own bodies, but to choose abortion if, if they decide to. And this is really focusing our attention on the right to privacy. And we're gonna cover some kind of like main highlight areas um, for how the right to privacy uh, was established in Florida and how it's more or less evolved and where things are heading um, currently. We can move on to the next slide. So the right to privacy was enshrined in the Florida constitution in 1980. Um, it was a result of a popular ballot initiative that earned 60.6% of the vote. You can see the, the, the uh, right to privacy uh, measure. Uh, it's right there. Every natural person has the right to be let alone and free from government intrusion into the person's private life. And then, of course, um, some additional language. But that, that would be the, the key, key uh, language that we'll be discussing here. We can move on to the next slide. So the first time that the Michigan or that the Florida Supreme Court uh, started talking about the right to privacy in regards to abortion was in a case in 1989. So nine years after the adoption of, of the uh, privacy amendment in uh, Henry T TW a minor. And so this is a case involving parental consent um, for, for minors seeking an abortion. And really what I wanna do is kind of pull out some key passages from all of the justices' opinions on that case. So from Justice Shaw's majority opinion, the amendment embraces more privacy interests and those and extends more protection to the individual in those interests than does the federal constitution. Florida's privacy provision is clearly implicated in a woman's decision of whether or not to continue her pregnancy. We can move on to the next slide. Chief Justice Ehrlich's special concurrence, specifically talking about whether or not the public was aware that the right to privacy contemplated and included the right to an abortion. And for him, it's very clear, very obvious, and that the public knew exactly what they were doing when they were supporting this amendment. Justice Overton in his partial concurrence, partial dissent, stating very kind of unequivocally that the right to privacy um, effectively codified the principles of Roe versus Wade as it existed in 1980 um, into the Florida Constitution. 
we can move on to the next slide. And then Justice Grimes, his partial concurrence, partial dissent. Th this, I think, is probably the most prescient or at least interesting for us now. If the United States Supreme Court were to subsequently recede from Roe versus Wade, this would not diminish the abortion rights now provided by the Privacy Amendment of the Florida Constitution. So there's a very clear sense among all of the justices that the right to privacy meant the right to have an abortion. And no matter what the Supreme Court would subsequently do, even if they would start to chip away or diminish, water down, recede, to use the justice's language, the right to an abortion in Florida would be robustly covered by that provisional amendment. We can move on to the next slide. We don't really see a whole lot of activity or action um, on abortion questions in the right to privacy really until 2012 with another ballot amendment, Amendment 6. The kind of key part of this amendment was that it said this Constitution may not be interpreted to create broader rights to an abortion than those contained in the U.S. Constitution. So this was seen by supporters of the bill as a way to ultimately um, start to push back um, on the Supreme Court's recognition of abortion, um, but ultimately to be able to, you know, uh, undermine the right to privacy protections that were established by the Florida Supreme Court. This amendment was resoundingly defeated in 2012. It had it lost by 55 percent. So it only had about 44 percent support. The people of Florida, as recently as 10 years ago, did not believe that the right to privacy amendment in their constitution should be in any way watered down. We can move on to the next slide. Of course, the big activity is the legislation that uh, took place in this last legislative session, House Bill 5, the Reducing Fetal and Infant Mortality Act. All what this did was uh, restrict abortions. They cannot be permitted after 15 weeks. Um, there were exceptions for the life and health of the mother. Um, but of course, as I mentioned at the outset, no exceptions for rape or incest. We can move on to the next slide. Of course, relatively immediately, um, abortion clinics um, and providers sued to stop HB5 um, because it violated the right to privacy of their physicians, staff, and patients. And the trial court issued an, uh, an initial temporary injunction. Of course, this is automatically stayed uh, when it goes to appeal. It went to the first uh, district court of appeal. And in the first uh, DCA, they denied the motion to vacate the stay. And so this effectively brings HB5 back into effect while litigation is ongoing. But the thing that's at least notable about the first DCA's decision was they brought up this question of standing. This might be considered the, the kind of uh, next step in the wave of, of, of anti-abortion um, litigation, or at least interpretation of, of who can actually bring these types of questions. It specifically said that clinics and doctors have not shown irreparable harm because their rights have not been violated. And so they cannot assert irreparable harm on behalf of pregnant women. And so they go further on to say when they're engaging with a, a pushback argument from the dissent in that case, that any former decision from the United States Supreme Court acknowledging such standing of a party to advocate on behalf of a person not appearing in the case regarding that person's purported irreparable harm is now in question. So at least according to the first DCA in Florida, this Dobbs decision did an awful lot more than throw the question back to the states and the people of the states, but also threw into question essentially every other uh, decision that the Supreme Court of the United States has made regarding abortion. So of course, this is currently under review by the Florida Supreme Court. We can move on to the next slide, please. Of course, all eyes are on the court now. Just for those of you who are not aware, there are seven justices on the court. Three of those were appointed by then governor, Republican Governor Charlie Crist, who is our Democratic nominee for governor this time around. The other four were appointed by the current Republican Governor Ron DeSantis. And critically, five of those seven are up for retention election in 2022. And so the people of the state are going to be able to weigh in 
and decide. Um, hopefully, um, on these questions about abortion, privacy, and whether or not the Supreme Court's decision um, on this uh, litigation involving HB5 is worthy of those people remaining in office. We can move on to the next slide, please. And so this brings up some questions. And so I, I'm, I'm not a judge, so I'm gonna forecast what I think they might, might be thinking through. So probably the first and biggest question is, will they continue to maintain that abortion is protected by the right to privacy? Well, judicial restraint would suggest that they should uphold their own precedents. There's no reason to change anything at this point. There's been no substantial factual change in Florida law Florida constitutional law that would suggest that this should change. But of course, what does originalism say? Because this is, of course, what is at the height of, or at least the, the dominant point of view at the Supreme Court, and of course, throughout right-wing legal circles. Well, <clears throat> at least the version of originalism that seems to be at, at the most <laughs> influential at the moment is public meaning originalism which would suggest the following question. How would a reasonable person have understood the text, the right to privacy amendment at the time of its adoption? Well, this is why having those, that initial opinion that described, according to the words of the Florida State Supreme Court justices themselves, there was no question that the public absolutely considered abortion rights to be included in the right to privacy. Now, if, if those of you are uh, might be more interested in, in digging deeper into this question, there is just an absolutely fantastic forthcoming article in the Stetson Law Review by Adam Richardson. It's titled, The Originalist Case for Why the Florida Constitution's Right to Privacy Protects the Right to an Abortion. It is a, a tour de force, and I, I recommend all those interested in, in taking a look at it. Of course, one of the other things that the Supreme Court could do is try to avoid some type of substantive ruling, focus on procedure by engaging in this potential standing issue raised by the first DCA. And of course, that's a possibility. And frankly, given the fact that the majority of the court is up for retention election, I would not at all be surprised if we don't get um, a substantive ruling from the court on this question, but in fact, we get more of an avoidance type of decision. Um, but we'll see, right? Um, yeah, we, we, we probably will be hearing something, let's hope, at least hopefully soon. Um, that's it. Um, I, I'm uh, very much looking forward to your questions and your, uh, your thoughts. Fantastic. And thank you both. I'll just say for a master class on originalism and what we teach in con law one adequate and independent state grounds, uh, certainly uh, reinforce those points, but let's see. Um, who's got uh, any questions or, or comments. Before I throw some questions out there. While we're waiting for some questions to come in, um, I don't know if this is beyond the scope of, of what you wanted to discuss, but I was thinking as, um, as you were discussing the role of states, obviously, versus the role of the federal government, um, that one of the things that's in the news now is not just the role of federal courts, but the role of the US Congress, because there have been proposals by Democrats to quote unquote codify Roe versus Wade, and we just heard, I think it was yesterday from Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, a proposal to enact federal legislation um, banning abortion, I think it was after 15 weeks. Um, do you have any um, thoughts about the, the role of Congress in, in this area of law? My own sort of intuitive view is that my understanding of the United States Constitution was that states 
would be permitted to enact their own health, welfare, and police power laws. Um, and this seems to me to be a gross overreach on the whole notion of federalism, frankly. Um, but I'm interested in what the professor has to say as well. Well, it, at, le at least my understanding of Senator Graham's proposal, it's largely based on Congress's Commerce Clause authority, which I think we all know how this current Supreme Court views such authority. As a general matter, I actually believe that Congress should exert more authority in these types of questions. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a, uh, a reconstruction romantic in that way, I guess. Um, but I, I don't think that any of those types of congressional actions would be able to withhold any muster under the current Supreme Court's view of these questions. Great. Um, See, so Elaine Lynn uh, has a hand raised. Yes, hi, thank you. Um, I'll just preface this um, with an apology first. I'm a first term law student, so I'm sure I'm not going to say this in all the <laughs> proper jargon. But my question um, that was really good food for thought, um, uh, Your Honor, is a glitcher. I'm sorry uh, if I got pronounced that wrong. But um, I guess it seems to me regarding what, whatever the each individual citizen's view on abortion and which side of the issue uh, or, or that they would vote, let's say. It seems to me that I, that, for example, some states such as California was um, working to approve legislation that would allow uh, not an abortion of a fetus, but even within one month after the baby was born. Now, that that seems, I think, well, that, that, that is, now we're not talking about what we might be talking about within the first 15 weeks weeks or three months or whatever, whatever it is. So whether that is to most people a little bit shocking, it, that one to me is, for example, um, so what's right for California, what's right for Michigan, what's right, right for Florida, et cetera, um, it does seem like this is, this is an extension of civil rights and that it should be to the people in each state. I wanted to get your opinion on when it, when there isn't, when it, it when it goes a little bit above and beyond what might be considered, what we generally consider um, in the novel sense of civil liberties. Well, I, I certainly hadn't heard anything about that California proposal. Um, my own uh, understanding of most uh, of the view of most people who recognize that protect is also plays a role in any legislative approach to abortion. And I certainly uh, understand that and wrote about that in my opinion. Um, Roe's framework on that, I think, uh, was remains a good one. I mean, Roe basically stated that once a fetus is viable, the state has an interest that most of the time overcomes the mother's interest. So, I think Roe was very prescient uh, on coming up with that kind of a simple but meaningful framework. Um, I, I remember once hearing uh, an obstetrician who did do abortions talk about, uh, in a lecture, talk about how to approach the subject of viability and legislation. And he said, from a medical perspective, from the obstetrician's perspective, once a fetus is viable, it's not an abortion, it's a delivery. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised to hear your, your recapitulation of the California law. I would su be very surprised that any state would try to, uh, or would agree to basically, uh, give up its ability to regulate a, pr a procedure a abortion once a fetus is viable. Um, you know, I, my own view is, okay, go I'll ahead. I'll clarify, I think it was something with 
again, back to the mother's health, but now it might have been extending it to psychological health. So even within 30 days after the normal term, um, a nine month term that, that it was extending to 30 days beyond that. But that was well, maybe the, the best answer is that states always have an ability and an obligation to legislate in the public health. And um, as someone who views herself as obviously uh, pro-choice, um, I, I think that that row provides the best framework for doing that. I don't know if that answers your question, but. So knowing that, knowing, and again, I apologize, I can't reference any specifics on the California legislation, but knowing that different states could be doing that, you you still, it doesn't, um, you still think by a federal, it should be a federal issue, not by the states. No, I mean, I, I think, I, I, I think that the states, that state judges and state constitutions, and most of all, state voters, preeminently state voters, uh, have a right to decide what their state's policy will be. And here in Michigan, it would not surprise you that our initiative will pass and it will be consistent, I think, with that initiative to allow the legislature to regulate abortion, keeping uh, in mind that there are two interests at stake once the fetus is viable. I hope that, that that's about as far as I can go uh, with a response. Um, but, you know, and again, to say that the states can legalize abortion in a ver variety of ways, either through judicial rulings or through the people voting. But in either respect, the legislature probably will have an ability to regulate the procedure. So. Thank you. Dr. Myers, did you want to add to that or? Good, okay. Um, I got a private message from somebody asking, are only students supposed to ask questions or can anybody, the, that the answer is an emphatic, anybody who's uh, who's on the call is welcome to participate and ask questions. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and check again. Does anybody else want to chime in before I ask another question? Okay. Um, I think we'll have one or two coming, but in the meantime, and if I miss anybody's hand again, please send me a private chat. Let me know. Um, you both, <laughs> uh, like like many of us, um, looked at the Dobbs decision, and and one of the more um, interesting components of that decision was Justice Thomas's concurring opinion, where he called into question the continuing viability basically of all of substantive due process, but especially of three cases, Lawrence versus Texas, Obergefell and Griswold. Um, so Griswold being the case about contraception, um, Obergefell being the case about same-sex marriage, but Lawrence being about much more than that, um, even, even whether a state could criminalize same-sex intimate uh, relationships. Um, with your expertise on state constitutions and state courts in, in Michigan and Florida in particular, what what do you see in terms of the role of the state in, uh, in involving itself in those rights as well as the right to abortion? I think that's a question that's on a lot of people's mind. Here in Michigan, we have an anti-discrimination statute that was just applied by our Supreme Court to uh, gay people. So it's not a, not, not a constitutional provision, it's a legislative one. So our Supreme Court resoundingly held that um, the right to be free from discrimination on the basis of sex um, also encompasses the right of uh, gay people to be uh, free from discrimination. So I think in that sense, um, we in Michigan are in a position to be far more protective of civil rights and civil liberties than the United States Supreme Court may wind up being. On the Griswold front, I would anticipate that 
our court would adopt, it already has adopted our Supreme Court, the right to bodily autonomy, which expressly, I, I would think, encompasses the right to use contraceptives. In, in Florida in particular, I think all of these questions are basically like up for up for discussion. In in 2008, for example, Florida passed Amendment Two overwhelmingly, which changed our constitution to change the defini definition of marriage to between one man and one woman. And so, if the Supreme Court were to overturn Obergefell, then what would that mean in court? Um, I think like a lot of states that in the early 2000s that passed these constitutional amendments, um, we would basically return to the same types of things that we're seeing in abortion, right? I mean, we'd have these kind of like triggered things that would come back and states would then have to go back and make these determinations again. Do they want to go back to these time periods where they had these very limited conceptions these questions of these rights, um, we're not. And, 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 and I think really what the essence of what Justice Thomas was suggesting and what Justice Alito put forward in his opinion was ultimately that all of these things should be up for question. And the Supreme Court shouldn't be necessarily making these determinations, creating a baseline for the country along all these kind of well, I guess what we would call culture war questions. And so I think we're going to see a lot more chaos across the states over the next few years as a result. Thank you. And I see a, a hand up from uh, Lisa Roos Church. The floor is yours. Thank you. I don't know if you can hear. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, I'm Lisa with MERS News. And I have a question for the judge. I just want to make sure I didn't misunderstand something you said. I thought I heard you say that the state courts have an obligation to interpret their constitution. But does that contradict your belief that or your concern about the Supreme Court tossing such decisions back to the state courts? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't hear you, ma'am. I'm not sure I understand your question. I don't have any concern about the Supreme Court tossing questions back to state courts, um, except that as a judge, I have no problem with that at all. That's absolutely uh, appropriate for the Supreme Court to do that. So I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay, I apologize. I must have misunderstood what you said. I thought you had indicated that it should be the state's responsibility, but then I thought you said you are concerned about them doing that. So I must have missed a word in there. I think I'm concerned about the patchwork of protection for civil liberties that may eventually result. And I think we all should be concerned about that. Um, I think that if, for example, you're a gay person and your civil liberties are restricted or uh, revoked, in one state, I think that's problematic. I think we don't want a, a, a system, I, uh, a United States, in which we have this um, unpredictable and ever-changing and uh, uneven protection of civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, when I went to law school and uh, grew up in the world, we had a Bill of Rights that it was understood would in fact be a floor uh, for the protection of civil rights and civil liberties. Um, and I long for that day to return. All right, thank you. I, I misunderstood part of what you said. Yes, thank you so much. That, um, that raises an interesting question. Uh, that's been on my mind, and I, so I think I'll throw this out there for for your thoughts. Um, when you look at both uh, abortion and what may be, uh, and, and Dr. Myers, you, you raised something that I hadn't thought of, which is that 
there's a there is a whole host of other trigger laws for um for same-sex marriage uh in the states and i wasn't focusing on that but if if you um wake up in in one state where a woman has a right to terminate a pregnancy and a same-sex couple can enjoy uh, a marriage, a marital relationship, and step a toe over a state line. And now you're in a place where a woman may not terminate a pregnancy, even in cases of rape or incest, and same-sex um, partners may not even engage in intimate conduct, never mind get married. What does that do? Um, what does that do? Uh, what does that mean? I'm struggling with that. Sorry to get so philosophical. I, I, I struggle with it too. That's exactly what I struggle with. Um, I'd like to hear Professor Meyer's view on that. Well, I mean, I, I think, you know, your, the, the, your, your take on this, I think fundamentally is the, is the, is the one to focus on, right? Why do we want have? Why do we want to live in a country with a patchwork of rights, where one person or has more rights because they happen to live in one state than another person who's the exact same person, right? But because they live in another state, they have less rights. You know, um, it's just, you know, we. <laughs> it's been a long time in this country since we've had a since we've had scenarios like that, and I'm not quite sure that people fully appreciate what it would be like to really go back to a time period where we don't really have this kind of basic floor of civil rights and liberties that no matter where you go and no matter where you travel in this country that you can expect baseline of treatment and we're, we're quickly approaching those places where we're not going to see that and we've got extraordinarily activist state legislatures that I, I guarantee you, this is my, this is my, <laughs> my guarantee is that we're going to start seeing state legislatures saying that if you engage in conduct that we disapprove of within our borders and you do it in another state, we will criminalize that behavior. And then what will that do? What will the Supreme Court of the United States do when that takes place? And then that's up a whole right. bunch of can of worms. It it does raise a question that Justice Kavanaugh's concurring opinion uh, in Dobbs, I think, lit a match for, and that is, um, is there a right to travel under the Michigan Constitution, or under the United States Constitution? Justice Kavanaugh seemed to say, well, if you don't, if you can't get an abortion in state A, just go to state B and you can get it. But to your point, to your point, Professor, um, there is no articulated spe specific right to travel in the United States Constitution. It's an unenumerated right. Um, does it exist? If it doesn't exist, let's forget about abortion. Let's say a couple uses contraceptives in state A and decides to take a vacation in state B and continue to use contraceptives. Can that couple be prosecuted if state B has outlawed contraception? Well, obviously the answer is yes. Is this the kind of country we want to live in? I I I, I can't think that it is for me. Um, it's I think it's a, a, a frightening prospect and a dangerous prospect. Great. But I see there's another, uh, some, we have a participant with a hand up, uh, Arjan uh, Malushi. Yes, thank you. Um, I am originally from, I was born in a communist country where uh, civil liberties um, didn't exist. And uh, many of us, when we immigrate to the United States, because, because of uh, the United States rights that are given to the individuals, uh, I have a background in law enforcement. I've lived in this country for 25 years and I'm planning to go to law school um, very soon here. But my question was, um, we evolved as people as, and as societies. And uh, I think that the Bill of Rights um, hasn't been touched since it was written. Uh, do you believe that maybe it's time for us as a nation to, to revisit some of the, or maybe add to the Bill of Rights or uh, revisit the Constitution 
Uh, so we have rights as a nation versus, you know, every state and maybe we can eliminate the patchwork of uh, this individual's uh, liberties. I'm going to suggest the professor start with that and I'll follow up. Well, I, 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 I guess I would just point to that. Most of the amendments that we've had after the 1st, 10 have been. In some way, a response to. The Supreme Court's rather crammed. Interpretations of rights or the powers of government. And so, if polling is to believe, to be believed, and the majority of this country believes in things like women's right to be able to control their own bodies, that believe that gay marriage is perfectly constitutional, then once the Supreme Court makes moves on these questions, then it's up to us as citizens to initiate a process to try to overturn their decision through constitutional amendment. That is how our system works. And that is what I would anticipate should would be the next step for those that disagree with what the court says. I would only, I agree. And I would only add to that, that the process of amending the United States constitution is very difficult. Uh, and it was meant to be. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it, the women's rights initiative or the uh, proposed women's rights amendment um, has been around for what, 25 years, maybe more, and has never made it uh, to the point where it can, it could be uh, adopted. So um, it, it, it's a difficult process, um, but I agree that politically it may be the only way to protect the rights that the majority of the people of this of this country seem to think we all have. Great. We're running a little short on time, but we do have another hand up. Alicia, Ambra, please go ahead. Hi, so I'm trying to um, turn my camera on. It's not necessarily letting me, but um, I hate to backtrack a little bit, but what Dr. Myers was um, saying about how states can go, in a sense, their citizens might go to a different state in order to seek an abortion, and their home state could essentially like go after them legally for doing such um, thing against like the original legislation of that state. What does that mean in the sense of, so we, we're all familiar that um, felons can't vote. So is this essentially an attack on women or is it, is it like an attack on the more lower class? Because I feel as if the more higher class can afford to get the abortion, they can find their way around it if that makes any sense. But the lower class doesn't essentially have that opportunity to seek an abortion. And I feel like they're being more targeted as a group rather than just women. It's just women in lower class systems, if that makes any sense. I mean, so certainly as far as we know, um, you know, uh, there, this has certainly been kind of part of the discourse of these questions about who is more likely to be really more severely burdened as a result of these these changes. Um, it's going to be more difficult for people that are, are from less affluent means to be able to seek treatment out of state, which is why a state like Florida is really important right now because of that patchwork, because all the other surrounding states around Florida have banned abortion functionally. Um, and so it does open up this idea that you have to have special means or opportunities to be able to um, travel, to be able to access those rights. But yeah, I mean, the, the larger question of, you know, how would this play out? 
you know, if, if some, if, if women in mass, you know, violate their state laws by seeking out abortions, then yes, a great many states, including Florida, um, would treat that as a felony and those women would lose their voting rights permanently. Um, again, I'm so sorry. I wasn't able to like word that question. So great, but I'm glad you understood like the gist of where I was trying to get with that. Um, I just didn't have like enough time to plan the question in my head and I didn't want to lose the track of time that we have here. I would only also point out, I, I would think about going back to the map that Professor Myers put up um, during his talk and look at the states in, in which abortion is outlawed. And for the most part, those are states that have a high concentration of poverty and particularly maternal poverty, high rates of uh, maternal morbidity and mortality. Um, so those are uh, th those are states where poor women are already being essentially punished for living in those states um, by lack of access to health care. Um, and the data says that it's not me saying that it's 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 the data when you look at the rates of maternal morbidity and mortality. So being poor in this country is a is a problem even if you want to exercise your right to have a baby. Thank you so much. Um, Audra, I'll, I'll ask you if it's time, should we um, conclude or? That sounds great. I appreciate everyone participating today. Thank you so much, especially to our speakers. That was really a, a wonderful discussion. Um, and thank you also for everybody who participated uh, in this uh, special event for Constitution Day. Uh, much more to say about all this. And to our uh, two speakers and, and guests again, I hope you'll come back. Uh, this was really an enjoyable talk. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks for being here.